Good morning, good morning, as we've got people joining. Good morning, guys. We're going to give it another minute or so just for a few more people to join. So just bear with us. We've all just been doing the very British thing, talking about weather. Oh God, we <laughs> have. Hope the weather is nice with you. Oh, here we go. Some more people in the waiting room. Are we recording this session? Um, we are. Okay, just checking. We recorded all that, all that nice weather chat we've just been having. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. the best bit to watch back. <laughs> Uh, needs a weather report for Hampshire and Kent, they can tune in to the first five minutes. <laughs> Welcome as people are joining. I'm just giving it another minute or so for a few more people to um, pile in and then we will get started. We're expecting about 20 people today, so um, but who knows, people might be stuck in uh, traffic dramas and mm. God knows what else that's going on today. Go. a few more people good morning as you're joining we're just waiting for a couple more people as they join and then we will write off so just bear with us thank you for joining us this morning though I'll tell you what, I will start with the intro as soon as we're three minutes past and I will just keep letting people in as they arrive. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm Becky, I'm founder here at Reflect Digital. We're a digital marketing agency that specializes in levering, leveraging human behavior insights to optimize the customer experience and to level up digital marketing. Um, we work across kind of SEO paid customer experience, those kind of areas. And we're joined today by some amazing partners of ours, the Behaviors Agency. So they are a brand and digital agency who use behavioral science to make brands more motivating, more top of mind and easier to choose. So um, hopefully everyone that's joining us that was expecting a brunch box has received their brunch box. So please feel free to tuck in. And a massive thank you to Lucy and Chantel on our side that uh, kindly got those all out for us earlier this week. Um, we want today to be interactive, so please um, ask questions as we're going and feel free to just pop them in the chat. Um, feel free to use emojis to, to share your reactions, anything just uh, to feel like you're, you're part of it with us today. Um, we all like to think that we're customer centric. Uh, we all try and have that approach with our marketing strategies, but how do you truly go customer centric in a particular industry? And especially one such as home improvement, which has such seasonal peaks and troughs and quite a lot of emotional purchases going on. So today we're joined by our strategy deck director, Zoe, and Steve, the planning director at the Behaviours Agency. So they are going to be delving into how human insights can be leveraged to understand seasonal trends and how they influence user behaviour and paths to purchase. So Zoe, our strategy director, she's all about client roadmaps, objectives, getting great ROI for clients. She's got over 15 years experience of crafting client-centric performance strategies and for brands such as Adidas and Monster Energy, and so some huge brands there. Um, she's, her experience spans everything from CRM to data to lead gen strategies, search and performance, social and influencer marketing, as well as a dash of kind of content marketing, PR and brand leadership. So there is a lot there that she's able to, um, to bring to the table. And then Steve, who is planning director at the Behaviors Agency, he's been in marketing for 20 years with an initial grounding in not-for-profit at NSPCC and public sector strategy and branding. He's also focused he's always focused on influence and behavior he's led strategy for accounts like co-op unilever and ea games and worked with agencies spanning advertising digital creative innovation and b2b that's enough from me i'm going to shut up i'm going to hand over to the amazing zoe and steve they're going to take you through as i said pop questions in we will definitely have time for a bit of q a at the end so um over to you guys Perfect. Thank you. That was a great intro. So welcome, everyone. Um, as Becky said, that's what we're going to be covering today. And hopefully we'll sort of be able to lead you down the road of, of looking at what sort of behavior and motivations to look at at each stage of the funnel. Um, Steve will take us through a lot of that kind of behavior led um, thinking. 
And then we'll sort of wrap each section with, as you move through the funnel, which of those marketing channels might be the ones you want to focus on and optimize to make sure you're going to help nudge people through that home improvement journey. So quick touch, um, sort of crash course, I guess, on what's actually been happening in the home improvement space. Um, and it's safe to say a, a, a lot. Um, I think when Steve and I were putting this together, the word upheaval uh, came to mind. So in the past few years, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, there's been a myriad of transport, staffing, supply chain issues. Uh, we've had the cost of living crisis hit us um, most recently. And everyone as a result in every industry, but especially across um, home improvement as well, has had to adapt and change their daily lives, their work lives. Quite literally everything has gone through a massive shakeup. Uh, what it's meant in terms of the home space is we are now demanding more from our homes than we've ever done before. They now need to be our workplace, our schoolroom for children, our place to relax. They need to let our kids play. We need to try and gather with friends again now that we're allowed to. We've got our four-legged friends, sort of more pets came home into UK homes than ever before as a result of, of COVID and the pandemic. And as a result of all of these things, the demand for DIY search terms, things like how to paint, paint colors, I want to replace my sofa, I need to renovate my kitchen, they have surged more than anything in the past 18 months. In fact, home improvement jobs posted online in 2020 went up by 12%, but the demand for tradespeople went up by 32%. Um, more than 13% of people started actually taking on full renovation projects in 2021. And over 45% of people were complaining they're actually now struggling to find tradespeople. So as a result, there's been a massive spike in DIY how-to related search terms. Extensions, annexes, conservatories, they're the sort of top areas in these multifunctional homes. And we've not only changed the way we live and the way we use our homes, we've also changed the way we're shopping and how we're connecting with the brands through our home improvement choices and our journeys. We've now got a real mix that's resurged between e-commerce and retail, with window shopping having been made pretty much impossible during the COVID few years. It forced people even more than ever to change their browsing and buying habits. And in the home improvement space, there was a massive uptick in people going online for shopping inspiration. Um, in March 2020, there was a great study called Understanding the Nation, and that discovered that whilst only 18% of Brits had increased their online shopping because of the pandemic in March, by April, that was up by 45%. And by December of that sort of pandemic year, a massive 68% were now saying that e-commerce was their first choice of retail. And now, now that the world has sort of opened back and is returning to a semblance of normality, People are still sticking to online shopping, largely because we've developed that preference. You know, we like things to be familiar to us. Um, it's forced us to become really, really, really familiar with online shopping. So those that weren't confident before now are. And whilst the stores are back open now, we're still expecting people to actively seek inspiration for that home shopping journey before they maybe step foot into a bricks and mortar store. So there's a real relationship at play there in the user shopping journey in the home improvement space. What that all means is that the home improvement space has got massive opportunity waiting for it. There's been the home improvement boom, that demand for multifunctional homes, an engaged digital audience that's more engaged digitally than ever before, coupled with the ability to pull people back into that bricks and mortar experience, and how can technology and digital empower that overall user journey. And it means you need a joined up strategy, being top of mind, um, getting through that marketplace clutter, being really user centric in your approach to marketing and your approach to messaging? And how do we make sure that a message is going to land at the right time in that sort of very confusing journey? And people are deciding to improve their homes because they are house proud. Maybe they want to increase the comfort and enjoyment of their home. They might be actually searching because they have to fix an issue. They might be trying to choose a product or service to fix something. Maybe they're upgrading an aspect of the home's function. They want to increase energy efficiency, perhaps within the home, improve the actual home's value. Maybe they're preparing to sell their home or they just need to update the home style. No matter what's driving that initial start of a user's home improvement journey, it's going to be inspiration led. There's going to be practicality of how did they get the job done? And it means there's a real sort of meeting of heart versus mind. What is going to drive that decision? Is it going to be an emotional decision making process? Is it a rational one where they're looking at the price point of different brands to make their choice? So there's that constant tug of war and how do we motivate human behavior to nudge them down the decision? 
quick interesting case study here, um, Lick or Coat, hopefully you guys might have heard of these two paint brands. Um, these guys really took advantage of that surge in home DIY in 2020. They were sort of two of the main paint players, if you like, that embraced digital first strategies. Um, these two within six months had a combined following over 200,000 people on Instagram. But when you look at actual Google search trends and how people are deciding whether to choose Lick or Coat when they're searching for paint, Lick is outperforming Coat by a mile. Interestingly, Farrow and Ball doesn't really show a strong kick at all in brand searches. So we're not sure our painters snubbing the pricey paint for these more affordable ones, perhaps. And when you look at Answer the Public, which is a main sort of Google trend that you can look at, Lick is getting more branded searches. So the things that we're seeing is, can Lick paint be used on wood? Is Lick paint washable? Where can I buy Lick paint? Whereas Coat has been struggling a bit, whilst it's doing really well socially, it's really battling in organic search. And that's because it's battling against non-branded search terms like one coat of paint versus two. What is peel coat paint, gel coat paint near me? So their brand name is getting sort of eaten up and cannibalized by those non-branded search terms. So search behavior since lockdown has really shown an uptick in brand led searches. And that's perhaps more people have time on their hands. They're happier to browse the website or it could be that that social kick is helping them get their inspiration. So whatever the reason, it just kind of points to a reminder that you really need to optimize all of your platforms to meet the user where they are, whether they're in need of inspiration, and it's ideal that they know and are actually looking for your brand name and that your brand name is not necessarily confusing to the organic searcher. So over to how some of these kind of behavior led things um, help us and work in that sort of sphere. Thanks Zoe. Yeah, I think it's, you know, there's a grand sweep there of renovations that Zoe's talked about, but we couldn't pretend that those are all the same. Um, paint is one of those things that people... Oh dear. Tend to do quite often, versions tend to be pretty rare. And actually, at the end of the day, people only people know much more about the things they do often. They become experts or feel expert in those things, whereas the other things they feel really uncertain about and really need the help in. So those DIY terms don't spread equally across the whole renovation sector. Actually, we really feel like we know about some of this stuff um, and can handle it ourselves. And that leads to quite different behaviours because at the end of the day, experts um, don't actually tend to need to search so much, need to be inspired so much. They already know what they're looking for. They already understand the market. They've already formed their opinions uh, in a lot of cases. They've already decided they're the savvy ones that know how to explore this market in a particular way. Um, it doesn't actually mean that they necessarily think they're interested in the category either. People who do things often treat them as routine and they don't tend to get excited about them. Whereas for most of us, if we're doing something that's that we're that we're new to, there's a whole load of interest and excitement and inspiration available to us, as well as a load of nervousness um, and and uncertainty, which means we need that reassurance and that convincing when we're novices. Um, so actually, behaviour is very different in different sectors, but also um, for those for those people who are perhaps a little better, not more knowledgeable about the sectors, they tend to be a little less open to brands and a little more um, focused on um, the more kind of rational decision making elements. So when we're looking at what motivates that person, uh, we've seen consumer behaviors become more dynamic and unpredictable than ever. Um, and as, as Steve said, people need more help navigating choice complexity. Um, Google actually had a term for this. They called it the, the sort of messy middle, which we'll get to. But what the reason for the messy middle, and we've used paint as an example, is that ultimately we're messy decision makers generally. Human beings, unfortunately, are not rational people. Um, the decision journey is made up of those multitude of triggers before purchase. We look for information about a category's products and brands. We weigh up and sort of assess the options to try and make a decision. And there's two different mental modes that are always at play. Either we're in an exploration phase, which is naturally expansive. We're trying to look for as many different options as we can. And then we go into reductive activity or an evaluation phase where we're really trying to condense and, and weigh up our decision making and narrow it down to our ultimate choice. So whatever a person's doing and across a huge array of online sources, they might be jumping between a search engine to a social media, to an aggregator platform of some sort, like a compare paint brands type of blog, to review websites. Either they're in one of two modes, they're in that kind of exploration um, phase, or they're actually trying to evaluate and, and narrow down. Um, and the behaviors agency has quite a nice sort of buying model that explains that further. 
Yeah, and one of the important things to note is that obviously from a Google point of view, Google tends to pick up on people when they're showing active signals of interest, because otherwise they're not Googling stuff. Um, and actually, there's a whole swathe of our time where we spend where we're not actively in buying mode for the things we're thinking about. Um, so even, even after we've entered the market, it's not genuinely a smooth curve like this. But actually, before we need something, before we realise that we want something, we're being exposed all the time to brand advertising, to going around to other people's houses and somewhere along the lines, our thoughts might turn to buying again. Um, but there could be quite a long time before we actively enter the market and until those triggers that, um, that get us to actually start actively considering um, items. So that journey between th when thoughts are turning to buying again and, and when we actively enter the market is a whole inspiration space, a whole opportunity for brands. Um, but, but once you, sorry, Derek, can we just get back? Sorry, sorry. sorry. Right. Um, and, and that change, that mindset shift from being just a consumer who's passively consuming uh, communications to being actively in market is a really important mental shift because our whole kind of um, attitude to the to the category changes, our whole attitude to to the way that we consume media, the way that we consume inspiration changes. Um, but that changes again um, as we get from that that. Um, exploration phase into that more like that narrowing down evaluation phase and as Google point out that's not a smooth curve by any means we jump back and forth in and out of market in reality but there's a general trend and we can detect and respond to signals uh, that change as we go through that process um, which means that we have different ways of targeting them which is the next slide so actually when we think about when people are out of market that's our opportunity to feed their motivation, to feed their interest in the category, their belief that the category solves their problems or will satisfy them in ways they're not satisfied at the moment. When we come to actively interesting, uh, being, people being actively interested, um, we need to be the brand that comes to mind. We need to be top of mind at that moment. We need to resonate with the category entry points um, and, be, and have strong um, memory signals that, that mean that we come to mind. As we get closer to purchase, we need to be easy to choose. So we need to remove the barriers to choosing us uh, and make us the easiest option as possible. And beyond that, we need to make sure we're making that decision feel right. So we're going to talk today about those four categories, uh, just working through that, that cycle in the simple sense uh, and talk about the media that can help us with that, but also uh, the, the kind of behavioural tools that we have at our disposal to make those things work. So, yeah, this is a, an overview of that. That, that idea of a cycle of behaviour where we go and go from um, media that are really about reaching out to people to media that are showing that they're coming towards us uh, to media that start to satisfy that need for, for um, closure and information that helps them judge and um, to the media that helps us reach out to them, keep them uh, a customer of ours, keep them happy through the process, perhaps the installation process, which could be a long term thing. So um, you'll see that pattern recur as, uh, as Zoe and I talked today. So first stage. Um, so we talked a little bit, I just mentioned motivation is the key here. So um, actually to, to enter any market, we need a combination of things. We need motivation, we need a trigger to enter, um, and then we need, um, uh, we need the things that make it easy to, we need the ca capacity to buy those things, so the resources to buy it. And in the absence of one of those things, we won't do it. But motivation exists before we're in the market so it's the it's the right place to start and this is our motivation map which is our way of kind of looking at the whole of human motivation for buying anything uh, and mapping it into one simple model which is basically from um is it is it removing a fear for us uh, or is it uh, maximizing an opportunity or a hope for us uh, so hope and fear is that scale and then on the other side is it about ourselves is it about us comparing ourselves to others and that lets you put these into four categories that then break down into subcategories so for instance um when we're if we think about our, our kind of um, natural fear, well, at the moment, there's a lot of fear around, a lot of kind of concern around um, the cost of living, obviously. So security is a really natural space and people who give brand, brands who give people a sense of control or stability um, can win in that space. But equally, there's people who want to take that opportunity, maybe have money that they don't want to see um, uh, get inflated into nothing. So they want to go out there and, and, and take advantage of it and live life and, and, and experience pleasure. There's also people who just like to be able to show off and, and you know, there's a plenty of showing off in the home category. And um, so status is important there, but also people like a good deal. And that's also a kind of winning against the markets, comparing yourself to others. And then the final category is that category of belonging, of feeling a part of a bigger tribe or family or home uh, or a sense of connection to, to a, bigger, uh, a bigger community, perhaps. And that's also a really important part of what we do. So some examples from home um, of that kind of category playing out. Um, you can see how a, a, a brand saying something like made you look, uh, made.com you look, um, that's clearly about status, about the op opportunity to show off and the opportunity to be proud of the, uh, of the purchases you've made. Whereas 
what's your thing the dfs line is perhaps more of a fulfillment line it's about really you expressing yourself through the through the furniture you buy and um, whatever your your personal expression might be and um, that sophology line about the comfort zone and um, is it more of a security sense it's clearly about right this is something i can rely on i can trust i can buy into and i've got a, a clear sense of the control of the price that it might come to and loaf is is a real sort of community of loafers um, it really sort of creates that mood of belonging of a sense of like uh, we're all we're all these kind of people um, and and that kind of brand plays into that space really well so those are examples of how the, those kind of motivations can come to life we work with sharps um the the uh, fitted furniture brand um who've uh, who've had a big couple of years thanks to everybody wanting to uh, tidy up the mess they're living in um, i'm looking around wishing i'd done it and behind this uh, lovely screen there's uh, there's plenty of mess so um sharps are a great brand for um buying into that sort of space between security and fulfillment there's a bit of beauty but there's also a bit of organization there's a bit of kind of getting control of uh, of all that kind of clutter in your house but doing it in a way that really is a beautiful expression of yourself so um fulfillment is a big part of it but there's a heavy dose of security in there as well and there's lots of channels that you can play with when you want to be pres present at that kind of pre-need space. Um, in the home improvement sector, we've spoken a lot about inspiration. Um, we know that social is great in this space where people are sort of really early. They might not even be sort of thinking yet about replacing a sofa, for example. But when they start looking at their favorite Instagrammers who are sort of, you know, commenting on a particular loaf sofa or whatever, they might, you know, be prompted to, to consider. So we know that, you know, help guidance and visually rich media lives beautifully in the social space, particularly across Instagram, uh, YouTube and TikTok. They're all great direct to consumer social channels to consider. Um, did you know, for example, terms um, and YouTube is a massive key destination at the moment um, to learn and be inspired about topics. Um, gardening, again, with everyone sort of being trapped in their homes, gardening saw a massive uptick. There were 47 million hours of gardening content watched in, on, on YouTube in Great Britain. That was an 82 percent increase year on year and people suddenly passionately investing in their gardens. Um, so really looking at how you can leverage video, photographic content, making sure, of course, that you target it and you amplify it via paid social to help ramp your audience reach up in the early stages. Um, you can also look for key trending hashtags um, across those platforms so you can try and sort of start introducing yourself into your customer's daily life on social channels as part of that scroll. And ultimately, even if it's pre-need, even if you're in that early stage of content consideration, you can still use social as a destination push to your website. So going through social as a channel um, to expose your brand, but then making sure you optimize the copy to pull people through um, to the web platform for that point of conversion or to try and sort of prompt them to that next stage um, can be really useful. Um, digital PR is another one. Um, as um, Steve mentioned, getting top of mind as early as possible. Um, it's always a challenge that marketers have to face. Uh, digital PR can be really great at helping establish that kind of brand awareness. So things like publishing articles, online press releases, uh, blogger events, journalist content, um, all of that kind of stuff is really great at getting real top of funnel visibility. And the great part with that kind of content is it does a double job. It can also, aside from answering the awareness game, it can help you build quality links back to your site. So that kind of genuine link building can actually influence um, your SEO and your website's performance. Um, that sort of content all helps with what Google looks at in terms of EAT, uh, which stands for Expertise, Authority and Trust. So it really helps you to build credibility and trust to your web platform um, and help you build out your referral traffic. And any kind of great content like that can really help you tackle that sort of top of mind um, and brand awareness objective in the early stage. Um, and then hopefully if you've done all of that, um, you might be able to then move on to the next sort of phase in the funnel, which is hooking people when they're actively, actively looking. Yeah, so active looking at the moment when people enter the market, whatever's triggered them into the market, um, you want to be the brand that comes to mind, you want to be the destination they head to. Um, and in order to do that, you have to have built those kind of category associations, those things that make you the brand that comes to mind when whatever that trigger might be, um, they, they're, they're brought to mind. And part of that is about building your brand in a way that makes it memorable and re easily recallable. Um, and there's there's four key components to that. There's that kind of category entry points approach of building around the associations with the category. So the things that might drive people into market, there's also just building a brand that everybody knows and recognizes and being consistent about that. So that actually that, that every layer of your brand keeps on building the same idea for people so they can keep on recalling that really easily. Um, then there's heuristics, which 
is brand effectively the, the distinctive brand assets. So that the elements of your brand that stand out and make you different from other people and that, and that are easily recalled. And there's lots of tips and tricks to be played with there. A huge amount of kind of sensory input that we can play with visual, sound, even smells that people associate with the brand. And then the final most powerful part of memory, um, memory formation is around emotions. If we can provoke an emotion in people and be associated with that positive emotion, there's a really good chance that that will link to memory because emotions and memories are very closely linked. So examples of people doing this within the world of uh, home uh, just shows the kitchen's brand, um, kitchen sort of world. Um, it's uh, that, that, that magnet ad uh, is all about that kind of, they, they called it shame, but effectively that kind of moment of wanting to be able to show off. You're worried, you're looking at your kitchen and thinking, this is shoddy, I don't want people to see it. Um, so they're looking at that kind of category triggers. Why might people get their, get their kitchen done? Um, whereas magnet, um, focus more on just building a brand that's incredibly consistent these days, a really impressive kind of set of um, consistency around, around how they talk and keeping it simple and making it really accessible for people. Um, actually, in, in kitchens, there's an oddly oddly a shortage of distinctive brand assets in a lot of ways. Um, it, Howdens do have a chicken that they never use, um, but actually if you think about the kind of symbols that other, other categories use and the ways in which people can kind of stand out from each other, uh, there's not as much as you might expect in terms of visual assets or, or even sounds or um, shapes that people associate with, uh, with particular brands. Um, but the one that's really been trying to push the emotions recently uh, is Ren, who made their great big greatest show style ad um, with huge amount of kind of happiness and joy attached to it. Loads of kind of fun and, and, um, and surprise in that element, in that campaign. So they've really sort of built that kind of, they've expanded into that kind of emotional space to try and capture the attention and make sure, um, and make sure uh, that that pays off. And it's paid off with Zoe, who's just had her kitchen done by Ren. Yes, I, I am a, I'm a sort of a case in the home improvement space, having just gone through the massive cycle of comparing Howdens to Magnet, to walking into showrooms, to, you know, doing the whole gambit before finally deciding on, on Ren's and my disaster called Reno starts uh, next week. So hopefully it'll be a good experience because Ren impressed me so far. So I'll, I'll let you know, we'll host another webinar about, you know, the ins and outs of kitchen renovations perhaps after I've may managed to survive that. <laughs> um, we, we work with Candine um, um, Luxury Vinyl Tiling. Um, so they, they're a brand that um, have a trade brand of called, called Palio um, and um, in, in that world, you know, part, a big part of what we need to do is make sure that when people think of uh, vinyl tiles, they think of um, uh, Candine or Palio. Um, so we built, um, specifically de deliberately built this asset of the horse um, so that there's just a very easy, memorable feature um, that we can have for, for, for that Palio. The horse is called Palio and it's helpful. Um, it's almost the kind of trade, uh, trade whisperer um, in the advert. So we've built a kind of, um, we've built humour into that ad, but also we've built a, a key brand asset that, um, that makes the brand more memorable and um, so that's a big part of what any brand is going to be built around the distinctive assets that you have that, that, that nobody else can own and if you've got those kind of distinctive assets to play with then you're all about how do you use them in the right way across the right channels to make sure you're getting the attention of the right decision maker um, and we have to optimize your primary website platform ultimately if you're going to start nudging people down there um, a very very rough rule of thumb that you can start with is to try and aim for at least 50 percent of your traffic coming through organic which means you're starting to hook in the relevant search terms you're trying to pull people towards your brand that are actively using google as a search um, as a search starting place so you need to make sure your site's in its best possible shape we need to make sure that google likes you from a technical point of view but ultimately we need to be paying attention not only to our brand aesthetic but also to answering what customers needs are and answering their questions helping them with their search queries so really investing time in that keyword research making sure that once you've done that learning, you're then mapping those keywords across your site and into your content, because if you don't do that, you're not going to show up in the discovery phase with generic search. So investing in generic keywords, making sure you're showing up as consumers look for answers to those terms, making sure things like your local, particularly if you've got a store and a bricks and mortar environment, your local SEO and, and NAP, which stands for name, address and phone number, is all up to date, will help, especially if you're trying to pull people into store. And there's loads to consider when it comes to making sure that that beautiful web platform with the, with the beautiful horse is going to be seen. Um, across some of the things that are technical to optimize would be things like schema review ratings, making sure that people can see those star reviews of your business. And um, that really speaks to people's need for social proof, need to sort of believe that this is a credible, trusted brand. Um, internal linking, updating your SERP knowledge, focusing on things like core web vitals, which are all to do with your page speed, um, your user experience, you know, optimizing for your images. 
and then making sure you're seasonally relevant. So there are massive like peaks and trends. We know that everyone's going to be going nuts in their garden before spring and summer. So making sure that we're taking advantage of, of optimizing our landing pages and all that kind of stuff so that people can find that, that beautiful brand to answer their questions. And then it comes down to how do you know what content's actually going to engage with people? And this is where really understanding the intent behind that behavior, sort of intent-led keyword optimization is key. A couple of ones you can think of as transactional. So this is where someone might be looking for, in my case, like, you know, cheapest flooring alternative or, um, you know, cheapest window treatments. They might be looking at, um, you know, buy kitchens um, or buy in store home kitchens. Informational ones, the reason why these are highlighted is this is sort of a bit of gold dust. We can really answer to, you know, how to kitchen ideas, what's the best paint. Um, those are really easy terms that you can start helping answer people. You can craft how to content. Um, you can offer up ideas and craft content that sort of answer that, that type of informational um, search. And then navigational is when people are sort of perhaps slightly further down the funnel, they're actually looking for an active login or they're looking for a store address or they might be trying to reach out and contact with B&Q. So ultimately make sure you're being relevant. Um, don't be scared of humor. Um, people do like responding to human style brands so you can add value through humor. Um, don't forget accessibility, making sure that accessibility is key. And mix up your formats. So, so mum is a sexy Google algorithm you may or may not have heard about. And ultimately, a, a very short crash course is to make sure that you are, you know, looking at format diversity. You're making sure that you can answer search terms um, across a variety of lots of different um, format considerations. So quick content brainstorm here. Um, if you think about your own sort of customer and their decision phase, uh, what's the sort of content thought process that might hook them into your world? What content might the audience really engage with? Is it likely to be a how-to? Um, is it likely to be voice optimized search um, for home improvement retailers that want to quickly compare paint or take a picture of a type of paint and do a picture search? Maybe it's a compare and contrast infographic between different sort of what does Ren offer that Howden's doesn't? Um, or it could be real life reviews by influencers. So we're going to give 30 seconds if it works, hopefully on the clock to just try and think of what are those common ideas. You can pop them into the, the Slack if you don't want to, if you want to keep all your ideas to yourself, that's also absolutely fine. Uh, but a quick sort of share some brainstorm thoughts around content that you think could really resonate and be useful to your decision makers in that kind of phase of their user journey. When it came down to Ren, they did a very good job with their content. There was some excellent comparing and saying we're 10, 20% usually less expensive than Howden's. We're usually 10% faster than Magnet. So they'd really leaned into that, not being scared to compare themselves um, to various people. And we'll sort of go into the, the chat in a moment and see if we've got any ideas when we get towards the end of the presentation. Other one to think of, though, is moving on to great content deserves to be seen by as many eyes as possible, particularly with um, your beautiful brand and making sure that as many people have the opportunity to see it. So you can think of paid media as your opportunity for amplification. It can really help grab attention, um, direct users into your funnel. Um, if you think about this year, this is kind of the year of bank holidays, particularly with the Jubilee weekend that we had. So you could, could, have, could have considered upweighting your paid campaigns to really amplify sale or incentive offers and timing that around that three day weekend when, um, in my case, I'm trying to badger my husband to paint the conservatory for argument's sake. So it might be a good time to try and upweight paint choices or paint discounts. Comprehensive paid media strategies can really focus on audience and focus bidding strategies that can help get you to the earlier stage of the funnel. And you can obviously iterate that strategy and plan targeting right through the funnel to help really cultivate and sort of prompt your users to conversions. And whilst you're thinking about Google ads, perhaps or Facebook ads, don't forget about video and YouTube again. Um, YouTube can sort of be seen as your second largest search engine. So in terms of driving that reach, driving that attention, video content can be one of the best ways to drive it. 95% um, of ads are viewable and 95% are still watched with sound on. So it's still a really good and um, useful place to kind of catch people. Um, just don't forget there's a handy little ABCD storytelling framework. So attention, making sure you're using that story. Branding, if you've got that beautiful horse or a chicken in your brand, um, making sure that you're elevating that really often as possible and early. Um, and like Steve said, emotion, so connection, helping people real feel and think um, and feel something and sort of seeing and it being exposed to an ad. And then don't forget direction. So ask them to actually take action. And Google's done some studies around this and ABCD style ads are often to see a 30% increase um, in viewability and engagement. So a couple of quick tips there 
in terms of how to use paid um, and how to look at how SEO and paid can sort of support you across that funnel. And if they've seen all of this great content, hopefully they're going to get to a point of having evaluated and being able to make an actual decision. And, and at that point of decision, usually what you'll find in, in home is that quite often people have got um, maybe two or three options that are all pretty much aligned. They're all capable of doing what they're looking for. They're all uh, reasonable options, reliable options, things that you could uh, believe in. And at that point, actually, the, the difference between those brands um, starts to disappear and people start making judgments based on, um, on which one's the easiest to choose. Um, ease is such a big factor in our, in our brain's chemistry um, that uh, we, it's often overlooked. But actually, um, ease is, is all about what people feel short of. Um, and there are six metrics that people effortlessly measure by because we use them all the time. These are the resources we have to spend at any given time. Um, we can always spend money, effort, time, risk, individuality or conscious thought. So it's all about whether or not um, which one of those is feels in shortest supply at any given time that really influences what people do. Um, and we can play on those because we use them all the time, um, because our brain makes these judgments really quickly, um, it's it's um, natural for them for those decisions to happen with what we call the system one part of the brain. So not the system two, very carefully considered, but the system one bit that makes a judgment incredibly quickly. Um, and so we can influence that, uh, and we can play to that, and we can help ourselves. We can help our brand feel the easiest choice um, by making it feel as if it's saving us one or other of these resources. Um, so perhaps people might be uh, influenced by time, so we can use the power of now, or they might feel as if things, the, the one that makes it the easiest um, is the one to choose, or it may be the one that doesn't stand out, from, doesn't leave you standing out from the crowd making an awkward decision that's different to what everybody else would do. So going with the herd, um, or, or, or even just feeling like the safe option, the one that you can absolutely trust because um, it's, it's very well established. And playing on these six, uh, these six metrics um, is a really important part of how we can nudge decisions, nudge people closer to that, uh, that buying decision. And, and you can see these uh, metrics being used all over um, uh, brands' sites and brands' kind of communications. Here's some examples from, uh, from Magnet. Um, and uh, I might just get you to see if we can have a guess at, uh, um, at which ones people are playing on here. So when you're, when you're looking at our customers' kitchens, um, which, which resource do we think people are playing on there? Which of those kind of um, features might, might come to mind? Not sure if I'm going to persuade anyone to go out on a limb here. So, um, so maybe I'll go with the, the easier one of how to buy a kitchen in five simple steps. Um, which of those do we think it is? Okay. Please. Ease, correct, yeah. Um, on the one on the left, where we're talking small or medium, and we've got the numbers uh, against it, um, the, the the actual amounts against it, that's putting it putting a number into people's heads. It's playing on that idea of money. Um, on the in the um, uh, the the bar where we've got hurry, offer ends soon, um, we can clearly see that's playing on people's kind of tendency to to um, be stimulated by time, but also a little bit of risk of missing out uh, that's being played on there. Um, so all of these kind of features, just skip on for me, Zoe. Um, you can easily see how these play out into that metric model. And any of those kind of features are going to help nudge people along those journeys. So when we're playing on that kind of herd impulse and trying to show people other people like them that they can relate to, it's all about kind of saying, oh, I can rely on that decision. I can fit into that pattern. And um, when you show scale and, um, and um, stability and branches, um, you're clearly playing on that sense of risk and giving people the reassurance that uh, if a business has got 195 stores, it must be reasonably reliable. Um, the, the, the ease with which you can, uh, your brain can get its head around choosing between the kitchens that are on offer, how it works, and, and other people's kitchens is, is a really simple sort of model. Um, and you can also see uh, the other ones we've already mentioned there. So this model really helps to kind of generate ideas as to how you might stimulate communications, keep them moving forward, keep people moving forward in that journey towards buying. And, and of course, securing that conversion moment digitally, playing off of all of those behavior indicators um, that Steve's taken through is, is really about how do you then help the decision maker with your actual page layout and with your page content. And we make over 35,000 or something ridiculous decisions every day. So that kind of ease thing is, is not sort of to be underestimated. That kind of decision burden can really lead to cognitive overload. So we wanna make that path to purchase as simple, as easy as possible. 
because always, as Steve said, if, if given the choice, the brain is going to go with the path of least mental effort. Um, so, you know, another behavioral science technique is called choice arch or choice architecture framing. And you'll really see this at play with visual design, with interactive design in, in UX, with interface elements, with the use of language. So you can see here, we, we're doing literal, very easy um, tick boxes on Fitbit. So you can decide which one do I want? There's, there's a multitude of Fitbit watches you could choose. Uh, which one do you want to go with? So you can see this at play across all sorts of industries, not just in the in the home improvement space. Um, and ultimately that motivating cue, uh, I'm using Ren because like I said, I've been a victim of falling to, to Ren's powers of marketing persuasion. Um, who doesn't love a deal? Our brains are sort of constantly seeking reward. It's released in the form of dopamine. There's an actual chemical positive kick when we, we feel like we've secured a deal. Um, and to again, playing on that fear of missing out um, that Steve just mentioned. So really helping nudge them to that happy spot. Um, and we've really seen because of this kind of massive surge in DIY, because of the massive choice now that in digital and in store, that kind of play on the reward and scarcity principle in the homeowner space is probably some of the strongest. So brands are using deals, offers, communicating urgency to drive intent. And looking at Ren as an example, just when I was going through that sort of navigation phase myself, in one, in, in one journey on their same website, they were telling me there was five years interest free, 20% off solid timber worktops. There were 20% off taps until the end of May, which is when I was kind of shopping. Uh, there was 40% off uh, woodpecker flooring, which is why unfortunately they, they lost me on Khan Dean. I went with woodpecker, sorry guys. Um, but on average, they were also telling me they were 6% less expensive than Howden's. And on average, they completed their kitchens 20% um, um, less expensively than Magnet. So, all of that was packaged up in their same single user journey. So it was incredibly sort of hammering that scarcity principle and that kind of you're going to get a deal plus a beautiful kitchen with Ren. Um, and as you can see, sort of the joining the journey when I was going through this, I was also being retargeted by a multitude of other brands in the home improvement space. So this is from my own Instagram um, during the period of time when I was hunting. And as you can see, the, the, they sort of picked up on the fact that I've been looking at paint, I've been looking at windows, I've been looking at kitchens. So my Insta feed at the moment is still chock-a-block full of paid ad targeting me because I've been all of, on all of these brands' websites um, in the past few weeks. But there are still ones that, you know, personally I might think work harder than others. There's some that are much simpler in terms of their call to action. Someone like Coat is very much leaning on visual kind of cues, whereas um, Safe Style PVC is very much leaning into that deal, buy now, pay later kind of um, leveraging. And Ren, as we said, is kind of showing the spring sales. So they're trying to play on a couple of messages there. There's a sale, there's that affordable luxury. So there's that kind of ability to show off potentially. And there's that made in the UK. So again, leaning into that trust safe space kind of thing. So we all know that behavioral science tells us we're more likely to make a choice when there's limited options available. So that limited choice bias. So don't overwhelm is the key trick when you're looking at your sort of paid ads or any of your kind of social messaging, make that decision as simple to communicate as possible. Um, and when it comes to the actual UX, when you're trying to get those goal completions, when people have landed on a site, um, there's a lot we want people to see and do. But ultimately, if you try and pack it all into the same journey, you might sort of divert them from why they came to you at the first in the first place. So it's OK to have things like pop ups on your website or value ads, but you really need to just not throw a pop up onto a page for the sake of it. It needs to have an obvious connection to the intended action so that there's always that clear path to the central journey. We don't want to get people lost in a in a maze. So if you're designing journeys, really lean into copy that converts, influential design, focus on your functionality and experience. You know, your journey needs to be useful, needs to be usable, needs to be findable, um, credible, desirable, you know, all of those kind of things to really make it sticky. Um, and it's about just sort of helping people get to that journey. And, and don't forget to really fall in love with testing and learning, please. Try moving your buttons, change your landing pages. Um, maybe up way to call to action. You know, the beauty of digital is we can test and fine tune ways to really lean into some of these, these behaviors and help nudge people in the right direction by understanding their intent, by understanding the behaviors that we're trying to answer to, to give them that point of, point of decision making. And again, to harken back to the sort of bricks and clicks combination, there's also a lot of fun to be had in utilizing the innovation and power of digital to enhance your actual in-store experience. So join up that holistic kind of rich experience between digital and the real world. It can really help you, you know, stand out from a competitor. At home, um, I'm sure some of us have done the whole, you know, tap on a sofa on the Wayfair website and hold your phone up in your living room so you can see what it would actually look like in your living room or, you know, looking at what a paint color would look like in your bedroom. 
it's really there to empower that experience, but you can also use it in store, you know, with interactive screens. Um, again, I'll just use Ren as my own personal example. They had their in-store design your kitchen experience that had a fully immersive VR walk around. So I was literally with a headset being able to see what my actual kitchen would look like, which was incredibly emotive um, for my journey. But AR, VR, or you know, simpler things like product 360s, all of those can be accessible without huge budgetary investments. Um, they're also massively scalable. So look at ways that you can kind of enrich your user experience by empowering through technology and digital generally. Um, so hopefully if we've done all of that, they've made their choice and they've bought you know, the paint or the Ren kitchen in my case, um, but it doesn't stop post-purchase. I think that sort of often gets left off and we wanted to just make sure that we don't abandon our customers once they've sort of made that purchase decision. Yeah, actually, from a from a behavioural point of view, um, the moment of purchase is um, a huge moment for the consumer, especially in big purchases, um, a huge moment of uncertainty um, and a huge moment of potential um, uh, buyer's remorse. Uh, and certainly all of that uncertainty is a, uh, is an opportunity for brands to step in and make sure they can take it away. Um, in, in fact, you know, so much of, especially in home, so much of that is just the beginning of the journey for the consumer. It feels to them like the beginning, not the end. Um, and actually making that decision feel right immediately after the order is placed or, the, um, or, or that decision is taken um, is, is a huge part of turning that into a happy moment instead of potentially a, um, a, a really fearful one. Um, but also giving at that moment that kind of sense of visibility and control of what's going to happen next. Um, we've all known that experience of kind of almost entering the black hole of, uh, of post-purchase and not knowing um, when things are going to happen next and how, how much in control of that. Even the illusion of control for, cons for customers um, can be incredibly powerful at that moment just to give them a sense of can they, can they predict when the delivery date is going to be, the installation date? Will they be, will they be able to know what, what's required of them? Um, from then on. So creating that kind of really focusing on giving people a sense of certainty um, and, and positivity at that moment is a huge part of making that experience feel right. Um, but thereafter also, there's ways that we can make that experience as positive as it can be by concentrating the pain points, by lessening the mental load for people, just reducing the friction in the experience. And part of that also is getting out of the mode of it being um, an impersonal transaction, but actually, you know, introducing the people um, who might play a part. Um, so uh, no doubt we all got to know DPD drivers and, um, and, uh, and, and the rest in, in that kind of lockdown period. And we start to get to know people and start to feel slightly uncomfortable about how many times they came to our doors. But actually all that humanity and that fun that you can put into that experience um, once people have made that commitment um, is a big part of how it can all feel positive and, and a build towards something great. And actually when it comes to completion or delivery, and there's a huge opportunity there to, to take that one moment of positivity, which uh, hopefully um, Zoe's about you know two weeks away from, um, and turn it into an opportunity for the brand going forward, either as an advocacy moment, um, a reviews moment, or even just as a way of locking them in as a future customer. Um, so really trying to capture that moment, and that, that completion moment into something that feels really positive. Um, and, and if not, make sure that um, we, we're learning from it or in any case actually learn from it uh, so that we can make sure that we're preferred the next time so we lock in that experience for people that, that actually it's easier to choose us next time as a result of having chosen us this time and so lots that can be done post-purchase to make sure that the experience is as positive as it can be. Yeah and to that point like one of my these are two of my favorite quotes um, which is you know Bill Gates was your your most unhappy customers are your greatest sources of learning so to the point of learning you've got to be brave enough to face up to criticism, to you know, negative comments on social. You need to be kind of aware of what might be said on your, on your Facebook posts, on your Instagram posts, in the comment section on your website, whatever it might be, to really understand where you might have let people down. Um, you know, customers can be incredibly forgiving as long as they see you being responsive, if there might have been an issue or a delay or something in the home improvement space. Um, and to just harken back, a sort of a common theme that we've been referencing today is that People forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they don't forget how you made them feel. And if you've celebrated the end of something, if you've been able to bring that humanity in, that kind of emotional lock that you can create to your brand is, is probably one of the most valuable things you can aim for throughout an entire buying cycle is to create that, mo that moment of sort of emotional of locking in that relationship um, post-purchase. 
So ultimately, how do you guarantee all of this? How do you make sure that you're kind of going to get your, your home improvement marketing bang on, that you're going to deploy the right channels, the right messaging, you know, the right brand to give you that success? Um, and hopefully we've given you some useful tips today, uh, but there is no sort of one fit for all. It, it does really demand a, a holistic strategy. Um, it has to be customer centric. You really need to sort of focus on those intents, those needs, those kind of human behavior indicators that we've, we've covered today. And really look at how you're joining up, you know, your experience and those touch points across those digital channels and platforms. Um, embrace that philosophy of test and learn whenever possible um, and make sure you are taking the time to understand the intent and then invest the effort. I'm going to try to turn my light back on in here um, and then try and invest the effort in creating a content and channel matrix that is kind of delivering to your user intent at all stages of that purchase cycle. You know, if you're harnessing the power of that human behavior in your strategies, in your messaging, in your campaigns, um, then you can actually build that trust at each and every opportunity with the customer that's going to give you the ROI at the end of the day. And so if we leave you perhaps with, with one thing to take away, it's really make the customer the hero. You know, understand how your brand can answer to their needs for ease or security or, you know, how do we help nudge them in a way that's helpful and keeps them and their best interests at mind. So hopefully we've equipped you with some value um, and some relevance to customers in that home improvement space, because ultimately, you know, we're all here to make sure you can get those conversions um, and you can get that positive ROI from your brand and from your marketing in this sort of very competitive uh, home improvement space. Um, and I think that's us today. Um, are there questions? I'm, I'm hoping there might be, but are there any questions? Amazing. Thank you so much, Zoe and Steve. That was, uh, I've heard it before, but I learned more stuff again, which is, uh, which is always the sign of a good webinar. So uh, and we have recorded it. I think I've just let another person in. So for anyone that has missed most of the content, or um, for anyone that, that wants to share it with colleagues, we're going to have a recording that we will share with you in the next 24 hours or so. Um, but yeah, questions. So people can pop questions in the chat or you can come off uh, mute. You can stick your hand up and ask questions. And um, I'll get us started. I guess like, I guess I'm left thinking if I'm sitting there as a home improvement brand, like where do I start? Cause I, I probably feel like I am doing some of this already. Like most people are trying to do bits of it um, and will feel like they're trying to move things forward. But where do I, I guess almost like how do I audit where I am and where do I start to, to really make sure that I am being customer centric and I'm moving things forward? Um, I think there's probably different ways to, to skin that cat, so to speak. I think when you're trying to audit where you are, I'm a huge data led person. Um, so I would naturally turn to understanding what your digital stats are telling you now. Um, you know, you can look at things like your goal conversions. Are they in the right space? You can look at your sort of engagement rates of any social content you might be doing and compare yourself against your your ideal competitor. So benchmarking yourself against someone can be really useful to sort of say, are you on par with what might be happening in the marketplace? Um, I think the other aspect of, of sort of auditing yourself is not being afraid to lean into your data. You know, if you're trying to change something and you've got an engaged email database, for example, you know, things like surveys or polls or actively looking for that two way input from an audience set can be can be really useful. Um, and I think perhaps, Steve, from your point of view and, and some of the things that I found fascinating from the behaviors agency is really, do you, un do you understand what your brand is trying to say? And have you tapped into all of those aspects of, of sort of brand signaling would be something that's probably worth a look as well? Yeah, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, brands are hard to change overnight. It's, it's really tricky to kind of, because obviously they're built on layers and layers and layers of experience and years potentially of uh, of um of work but things like emails and web pages are incredibly easy to change overnight um, and actually start to see the results of it so in a way like it's always easier to start uh, if you're looking for a place to start with those kind of incremental changes that could be made and experimented with and tried um, and and again that your approach of you know kind of talking about tr testing but maybe using the metric framework as a way of doing that testing you know can firstly can we take some stuff away because uh, quite often web pages are incredibly complicated and we're asking everybody to think about 17 things at once and um, so actually reduce taking things away to start with and then actually introducing things that perhaps are, are kind of ways of nudging that behavior making that page as easy as cognitively easy as it can be 
Um, it's a good place to start. And actually, in a way, the other the other thing to do is to say, well, where is the problem? As you say, if you're looking along the kind of look along that customer journey, do we have a problem attracting people? Do we have a problem um, of uh, getting interest from people as they're looking at us? Do we have a problem converting people um, or is it a problem post purchase? And most of the time, most people are going to focus more at that front end because the more you get in, the more likelihood you're going to have success at the other end. Um, but finding that kind of using almost using that framework of four quadrants and going, where do we want to focus our activity? Um, obviously, we, we're we really happy to help at the very top end, um, but we're also, you know, there's plenty to be done in that kind of middle section um, where, where actually the difference is made between um, someone who you've invested a lot of time in getting through this journey, but haven't necessarily converted. That's a huge payoff to be had out of, out of those people too. Yeah, I love that. And I do love the metric system as well. It's a really easy one to kind of digest and to test. And, and yeah, you're completely right, the digital channels and, and actually taking stuff away from the page and looking at like the CRO tools, the tools that we use here are amazing. You can split test, you can have two completely different versions if you're getting enough traffic, um, two completely different versions and start to see which works better. So um, yeah, that's really awesome. Um, any, I'm just Yeah, I think we... we um, uh... And web web's really obvious, but email is another place where people really cram emails. You know, people send people emails that are basically entire newsletters just in different boxes. Um, and actually, the, the best response you're going to get from an email is if you've got a choice in the top where it goes, do you want this or this? And people might just click that because it's a, it's a system one choice trigger. Um, am I more this or this? Um, and, and actually, in the context of helping people through a journey, helping people decide something, do you like this color better than this color is actually a pretty good way of forcing a choice out of people and they might just click and that click you can learn a lot from so I, I think emails are one of those places where you can really strip back and really simplify um, and actually start testing some stuff about what you get a response out of yeah. and there's also nothing there's also something to be said about not forgetting the fact that you're a customer of your own brand so you know have a workshop with colleagues with you know your team members and go just you know for me i've just bought a kitchen what was that journey like? Where did I start? Where did I get stuck? Where did I get frustrated? You know, which brands were kind of answering the tick boxes and actually kind of do the actual day in the life walk, walk through of what does this journey look like? And then lay your brand against it and go, what do our platforms look like at each stage of that journey? Are we answering the need? If this is a frustration point, what are we doing to try and answer to that frustration? Um, mm. So, you know, running a journey workshop like that can, can be incredibly helpful as well. Definitely. And that kind of the point Steve made about wanting to like two options on an email. I don't know about anyone else, but on social media, actually on like Instagram stories, someone puts a quiz or a poll, even if like I have no relevance to it at all, I can't help but having to choose something like I have to play. I have to get involved. I was doing it the other day with something that I had no chance of knowing the answer, but I was like, I've got to try. So yeah, again, like looking at other channels, like how can we engage people? Because give people a button to push and they quite like pushing it. <laughs> um so yeah Becky, i think you're just demonstrating i'm showing my age clearly by referring to the old-fashioned mail and actually quite right social posts are a far better example well no but email is yeah i think email well i don't know email is one of those things isn't it we do get so many of them actually we're seeing more and more at the moment um direct mail coming back because people have suddenly seen the opportunity and physically sending things to people and going really old school because actually well, it's uh it's dropped off so much so and also because people are at home, which means that now the inbox ping that we used to all get slightly excited by is actually the sound of the, the um, post flap on the door. Like uh, there's still something about, oh, I wonder what's arrived. You know, that there's something that's actually by happened. Amazon delivery coming today. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Amazing. Well, we are very nearly out of time. I'm going to just pop the um, uh, survey into the chat there. So if anyone would like to give us feedback, we'd really appreciate it. I'm going to also drop um, an email later today or I say I right, Chantel's going to follow up um, and she will have that link on there as well and yeah we would really appreciate feedback just on format etc so that we can keep making these uh, events as great for, for the audience as possible and um, I've learned a lot I hope everyone else has it was really great thank you guys so much and yeah we will get recordings out to people slides out to people and if anyone would like to follow up um, and chat more about this and get some ideas of how how this might work with your brand then then please do let us know and yeah everyone enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thank you so much for joining us.